let's begin. Welcome back. We're back at Virginia Tech. It's all back to normal. We're all in the classroom together. The masks are a bit new, but they're kind of old too. So this year, all of your instructors cannot wear the screen. Um, I kind of prefer this. I used a screen all last year, and it glares back at you, and I hear this echo. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So I can, I'm usually pretty audible, but if I ever start mumbling, just say speak up. So um, if I need a microphone, I will use that. I do have a microphone for my camera in the back. I just can't find it this morning. So if the audibility on the recorded lectures is a little bit low on this first go around, I'll try to improve that. But I've used it both ways, and it seems to work. Um, so saying that, I am going to conduct the class in a dual modality by default. Now what I mean by that is this is an in-person class. Everything on campus is supposed to be face-to-face. -face. And so we're striving towards that. I think the real reason is because it's not effective doing only online schooling. So the reason we're strong is because we're able to come together and share ideas. And so you are Virginia Tech, you are the class, I'm just a guy. And so you guys being able to help each other and work through problems and motivate, um, that's the name of the game here. Now we'll have a few different resources. I'll set up a Slack page for you guys probably near the end of the week when I figure out what the, you know, once the class becomes steady state. So we do have 49 people enrolled for the class. The room will hold that. Um, there's some people trying to get inside the class right now. I'm going to tell you what I tell everybody every semester. Just keep your eyes on the enrollment. People tend to drop out. It is first come, first serve. I wish there was a queue. There's nothing I can do. So, um, you know, you've got a couple weeks to figure that out. So I'd say if you want in the class, your probability is very high. So based off of what, it's all a conditional probability. Conditioning on this year is kind of like other years, and I know that it is. So not sure, but I think the probability is still high. So just stay on it. Um, I'll start you out with a couple reading assignments and so forth. We'll go through the syllabus briefly in a moment. Um, I'll go through more of the syllabus next time. I want to tell you a little bit about days and not just about logistics. And I'll try to answer all of your questions as we go. Um, I will be sending you an email in the next couple days with all of the information about the class. So probably tonight or tomorrow I'll have an email out to you with a link to the YouTube page that I use to host all of the videos. And so we'll have video support for every class. And I should have it up within 24 hours or so. Um, every semester I've done this, there's been at least one lecture that I get home and my video's corrupted. And so what I do in that case is I re-record the, the lecture for you. And I'll post it. So if that happens, all I ask for is just a touch of patience on all of this. The probability of something failing is I add more and more technology to the class, keeps going up, it does not go down. So at some point when I'm running simulations for you up on the screen, my computer will crash. So just a little bit of patience in there. I'm not sure when it's going to happen, it might happen today. Okay, um, so video support, we'll have Slack support as well, I'll set up a Slack page for you. And then you guys can... Um, Help each other, especially if you have to stay home and quarantine or something happens. Um, I will go through the specific rules, but I think we know it. If you're showing any symptoms of COVID, stay home. And I kind of like that rule anyway. You know, I always thought that's the way it should be. If you have a cold, stay home. You know, don't make everybody sick. So I hate getting sick. So last year was the only year in all my years at VT that I did not get sick during the school year. It was awesome. So some of our preventative measures do seem to work. So I didn't even get my common cold. So that was great. I usually get sick once or twice, and then I'm just dragging it around. So anyway, if you guys come to see me in my office, wash your hands first. So I think it has something to do with that. So you know, if you're sneezing and coughing, 
shoot me an email. You know? <laughs> so, and so I think that, that we've learned a lot of lessons from last year that we can take forward moving on. Now, we're human, we never remember anything, but let's try. Okay, any questions before we start out? You think you're just dying to know? So I want to take you through a few logistics. So this is your most important resource for the class. It's the course web page. So I will write that down for you. So this is www.apps.stat.bt.edu. Here's the important part. There's a slash right here. There's no such thing as an arrow that looks like that on your computer. So no space right there. And it's just my last name. Leave it. And I don't think caps matter one way or the other. So you might want to check that out. Um, depending on your machine, www, maybe, maybe not. So I've had people come to me and say, what you wrote down, it doesn't work. It does. You know, so maybe you need to put the www on your thing, but it's going to bring you to this page. And this is where you're going to find most of your materials for everything. So you'll go to this link, Courses Taught, and there's one class that refers to you. I do keep some of my old classes up in my old materials, and I just reset this page yesterday. And so if you ever want to get old materials from my classes, I usually just have them out there. So you can see what I taught, what I handed out, but we're starting fresh now. So that's us, Bayes. And here's the basic course structure. It says you're going to learn some stuff about Bayes in different aspects of Bayes. And it basically says we're going to start simple and we're going to move to more complex things, more computation. So we will have a lot of computation running throughout this class. And so we're going to do a balance between theory, derivations, so being able to do things analytically and being able to do them computationally. And so, I used to not do so much of that, but I think nowadays, if you're not computational in your classes, well, that's all very nice, but how do you actually do this stuff, you know? And so we're gonna teach you to think about different aspects of analyses, and then we're gonna teach you some skills so that if you can't do the math, you're still in the game. The holy grail of all of this is that you can do both of them. And so the computation, I'll try to instill in you that if you don't know the answers to an analytical problem, you can always approximate it real closely and see if you're close. You know, so I love being able to simulate things and plot them over the theoretical results. And so, even if I don't ask you to do that on specific problems, you should do that. And the more you do that, the stronger you will be, and the more you'll understand everything. So the only thing you give up is time, but that's what we are giving up. So don't ever let the, the time be a hindrance to you. So anyway, it says we're going to be doing a lot of computational and theoretical stuff. And I wrote down some topics. Um, every year this changes a little bit. Now I'll point out to you that on my YouTube page I have the last two years of videos. And we'll follow roughly that same trajectory. So if you're looking to get ahead in this class, then you can just go to the lectures. Let me show you where that's at. So let's go new tab, YouTube, and I'll just lean in lectures. So that's me. So lots of videos up here. You can scroll through them. So this is the last class I taught. So I taught statistical inference last semester. A lot of you were in that class. So those are still up and I'll I intend to keep those persistent forever. Um, and then there's base. And so this is last fall's class. Sometimes I have a student in here doing a lecture for you. That can be very good. So we'll probably do the same this semester. But you can always review. You can go back. So if you want to see roughly what's going to happen in this class, click on the link, you know? And so I've gotten a little bit better over the years of filling in what the topics are in the, the comment dialog box. I didn't do that for any of the days classes. So you'll have to like 
look at the very beginning of class. So usually what I write is today. So if you want to see what the lecture is about, all you have to do is go to the first second of it, and it will be detailed on the course. So today we're going to do our intro. Introduction to maze. And we're also going to do the syllabus. Just what everybody likes to hear. So, YouTube, the Lehman Lectures, Google will find it. And I will have these videos for you within 24 hours. At least that's my goal, usually sooner. Okay. So, enough about that. Um, let's just look at the other important link right here. So this is how I'm going to disseminate everything to you. I'm not going to use Canvas or Blackboard or Scholar or whatever the newest version is. And that's the reason I don't use it, is it changes every two years. I like to just maintain everything here. It just makes it simpler for me. When you want to know kind of what your, um, where you're at in the class, I do that after the midterm. So I'll show you the distribution of scores. I'll talk about grading. I'll show you where you're at, but you kind of have to wait to get into it. So I don't share with you everybody's home school, things of that nature. If you ever want to know where you're at in the class, just come by my office at some point after class. I'm always around for about 20, 30 minutes, and I try not to book it myself with a meeting. So if you guys do need something, I usually give you about 30 minutes of office hours where I'm prepared to do it after each class. There will be some exceptions, but that's one of my goals. Okay, I just clicked on the schedule button, and this will have all of your materials. And I'll be adding to this throughout the course. It'll get longer and longer with more and more links. So every link you should click, click on if I put it up. Sometimes I give you a little bit of code. Sometimes I give you my presentation. Sometimes I give you LaTeX files to things. If there's ever anything you want, you can ask for it. Sometimes I thought, I wasn't intending to give that to you, but sometimes I change my mind. So you can try to compel me. Um, I do have a homework already up there. It's pretty easy. It accompanies this paper right here. It's called When Did Bayesian Inference Become Bayesian? And Bayesian is in quotation marks. So the question is, is when did we start calling it Bayesian? What we're doing? And it took a while. And this paper is really long and really interesting, and it gives you a historical overview of this discussion of Bayesian statistics. Does anybody know what we used to call Bayesian statistics before we called it Bayesian? Inverse probability. So we flip the conditional statements. We'll be talking about that, and that's what Bayes' theorem does for us, is it flips the conditionality of the probabilities in hand. So, we might have a model that describes the probability of the data you observe given certain parameters. So like a normal distribution, what's the probability of seeing x's in a particular range given the parameters? And the parameters are typically the mean of the distribution and some measure of the spread, whether or not you call it the standard deviation or variance. They all have to do with the same parameter. And sometimes I re-parameterize that and I talk about a parameter called the precision, which is one over the variance. We'll be doing those manipulations throughout class. Oftentimes we get to see the data and what we want to know is what's the probability of those parameters being certain values given the data that you've seen. So Bayesian is always trying to flip that conditionality. So the Bayesian is always putting the probability on the thing you don't know given the stuff that you do know. So that's a beautiful thing and that has no bad. So we'll be talking about this in kind of the parametric setting most of the class, but then we'll start moving into probabilities on models. We could possibly talk about probabilities of missing data, data that you didn't observe and you want to impute. And so all of those techniques are Bayesian at heart. And so even if you're not a Bayesian and you're trying to come up with something like it, I bet you do something that looks oddly like Bayes. So there is 
a tendency, at least in the past, for people to fight over some of the nomenclature that we use, and I'm gonna try to dispel that for you. I'm gonna try to tell you what's good about Bayes, and even if you're not a Bayesian, you should do it. So, if you wanna phrase it some other way other than a Bayesian, you're probably doing something Bayesian if you do these two steps. So, and I'll try to tell you about those. Um, this paper tries to answer the question, of when Bayes became Bayesian. So I should start it on this. Um, the first time I read this paper, I didn't read it word for word, but I did skim it pretty thoroughly and I knew where things were. Lots of history, lots of citations. Have fun with this paper. It goes on for about 30 pages. Lots of citations in there. And so one thing I like to do when I read through a paper so I like to flip to the bibliography pretty quickly. So I don't skip that. And I try to see which papers have they cited. So me as an academic, this is one of the things I know really well, is all these papers. And you're gonna be trying to do that throughout your careers is, what's the archive of papers? That's what makes you a scholar. Being able to cite them, knowing who these people are, what they've done, what they've contributed, and how it relates to other people. That's what makes you an academic. And then of course, being able to add your own paper, cite, and attach it to everything else, and make a contribution. Don't ignore that part. Nothing's technical in this paper, so it should be fun reading. Again, you don't have to read it absolutely thoroughly to answer the questions I'm gonna ask you about this, but you know, take it seriously and cut a couple hours. So probably you don't need to spend 30 hours reading the paper, but spending at least two hours reading that paper um, is about where my expectation is. Some of you will get really into it and be like, well, I'm gonna spend like 10 hours reading this paper. It's the beginning of school, it's really interesting. So I've read this a couple times and I've kind of enhanced my knowledge. So always what I do when I read a paper is I read the intro, I skim through and I see what the topics are, and I read the conclusions, and then I go and read the meat in the middle. So I read the intro first. If I ever want to know where the important thing is in a paper, I look for this last sentence of the abstract. So this is a long sentence. But that sentence is supposed to tell me what the paper is about and what they're going to answer. Does anybody know what that sentence is called? Yeah, it's a thesis statement. So that should always be there. This is a really short um, abstract. This paper provides an overview of two Bayesian developments, beginning with Bayes' published 1763 paper and continuing up through approximately 1970s. So that's not modern Bayes. There's a lot of stuff that has happened after 1970s. So for instance, all of us. I assume I'm the oldest one here. I was born in 1974, so this predates all computation. And that's really the thing that made Bayes popular, is that we can implement it and carry it out. So philosophy is fun, but being able to answer a question makes you useful. So we'll try to focus on both of those things to some degree. So I think understanding why we do things, you know, and asking deep questions about it is also important, not just being able to implement something. So we're going to try to strive for a balance. So that's what I'll be asking you to do. Read that paper. Um, I do have some slides that I'll share with you. You can click on that you can pull down the PowerPoint that I'm about to deliver to you. Homework three, or homework zero is out. So there's a couple questions here. And so first I want you to read the paper, and then I want you to answer this question. Who originally coined the term Bayesian? So now that's a loaded question. And I will point out, I think there's three good answers in the paper today. So there's also a whole bunch of not good answers. And I've seen everybody come in with lots of different, like, I don't know, I just skimmed this thing, I found something real quick, I cited this one sentence that I found. It's like when I wrote a, a um, book report back in high school. 
me to find some sentences out of this thing. Throw it down, maybe that supports it, but I missed the whole point of everything. I think there's three good answers here. So who made the term popular and who came up with it might both be answers to that question. Who actually first came up with it and then who popularized the term? Those are two different things. And I think the answer to this question does have to do with that. I think it does get partitioned like that. Um, so again, this is my opinion. Three maybe good answers, but I can be compelled that maybe that there's some other reasonable ones in there. And it's certainly not one person that created all of this. So somebody catalyzed it, and then all of a sudden it became very, very popular. Okay, there's a different question. Who's the founder of Bayesian statistics? <coughs> That's different than coming up with the naming of the field. But who came up with the thing and maybe didn't name it yet. Does anybody have an answer to that? Who's the founder of Bayesian statistics? Yeah, it's a, right, it's like, it's kind of like, shouldn't it be Thomas Bayes? Personally, I don't think so. So I think Bayes came up with the probability rule that Bayesians use. So Bayesians use Bayes' theorem in a way that some other people do not. And so, we have to talk about that. But everybody adheres to Bayes' theorem. It's an un uncontroversial fact. So it is true. So if you believe in the ax axioms of mathematics, you know, going back to the counting system and you buy into all of that stuff, which I do, because <laughs> it orders everything for us and it's extremely useful, um, it's uncontroversial. But Bayesians apply the rule in a particular way. And I'll try to run through that in the next couple minutes if I can get myself to stop talking. Problem two. I have two things going on. My L's represent likelihood functions. We'll have to talk about the notation a little bit. But if you know what a likelihood function is, it's that thing, regardless of which notation you apply to likelihood functions. So understanding the notation and what's being expressed is important. So in my class, the bar will always mean conditional on the thing to the right. So um, that first row is the likelihood of theta, where theta is some parameter, given the data that you've seen. And I have different values of the likelihood. And if you add those up, it'll add to something greater than one. I'll have to point out to you, likelihoods are only expressed up in proportionality. I could multiply all of those numbers by any positive number, so long as it's the same, it's still the same likelihood function. So likelihood functions <laughs> express a shape, but its height doesn't mean anything. It's important to know that. And so I have a likelihood. Likelihoods have to be positive. So we don't have negative likelihoods. We don't have negative probabilities. Likelihoods and probabilities are different things. They have something to do with each other, especially if you're a Bayesian. And then I have a prior distribution, a distribution over the parameter set. Okay, so there's two ingredients to a Bayesian analysis, the likelihood and the prior, and that is it. So and hopefully I can show you what Bayes' theorem is before we conclude this class. So, Likelihood times prior. What I want you to do is I want you to compute the posterior distribution over the valid ranges of theta. I want to point out theta is discrete right here. How do you know? Because I built it into a table. It's a discrete thing. All values of theta have been, ex it's been assigned a likelihood and a prior, so this question is answerable. And I want you to plot the likelihood, the prior, and the posterior all on the same graph. And then I want you to compute this. This is the expectation of theta given x. So it's the posterior expectation of theta. If you look at this and you go, oh, wow, this looks brutal. I have no idea. You're in the wrong class. So if you need more than 15 minutes refresher on this, it means that you haven't taken a basic probability class and you don't know what Bayes' theorem is, my expectation is, is that you have some familiarity with probability distributions. With probability itself, you know calculus, you know linear algebra. You probably know what regression is. 
So all of those things, this shouldn't be your first steps class. There is a baby in class, and sometimes people will call it 5444, but I want to point out it's 5444G, which is really 4444, which is the undergrad class, but grad students sometimes take those classes. So if you don't know what any of that stuff is that I just said, probability distributions, parameters, likelihood functions, if that's all brand new, you probably want to go take one of the earlier classes and then come to this class a little bit later. We will be going into a lot of things that 4444 does not cover. Okay, that's it for the first assignment. So if you can read the paper and answer the question, this exercise, Stephen, how long would this take you to do? Um, the whole thing or part Just that. Five, five minutes? Yeah. So probably no more than five minutes. And that would be like three double checks. What's the key to getting this problem right? Computing the right number? Is there any trick or anything like that? Really no. You just have to normalize everything properly. Normalization. That's the only thing I ever see people do wrong is they don't normalize everything. Probabilities, once you compute the probability distribution of theta given x, that needs to sum to 1 because it's a probability. So you're going to need to normalize everything. Okay. So not too hard. That's due on September 3rd. So you have plenty of time to get into this. And then I'll start giving you more challenging exercises. So, but we'll start off just kind of trying to understand what phase is all about. Okay, so that's what we have right here. I also provided the LaTeX file for you. So if you want to learn how to LaTeX everything up, I do prefer clean, polished homeworks for your own archives. If you think it's a waste of your time to write up a homework assignment nicely, my grader will probably have a word with you. So, and I'll say that it's okay. If they can't read it, can't find your answers, I'm going to say to my grader, go ahead and just hand it back to them with a zero. And I'll probably say you have an opportunity to go do it, like in a professional level. Um, I found when I was in graduate school, taking the time to cleanly express my homeworks and not turn in my rough draft, made sure I remembered the problem. So that there were a couple phases to my learning. There was one being able to solve it, and then I had to review it again and make sure I understand it. So that I'm not like, I remember this problem from a long time ago. I kind of remember being successful on it, but I really can't remember because I just raced through it and I turned it in. So it'll help instill everything. So I prefer LaTeX, but it's not necessary. But I highly prefer it because it's better for you. Okay. So the schedule link is important. And then the syllabus is the contract with the class. And so this is my syllabus. I'll need to make an update to it. Um, but that's today's date. Um, I'll kind of point out Virginia Tech is committed to uh, protecting the health and safety of all members of this community. By participating in this class, all students agree to abide by the Virginia Tech wellness principles. It says wear masks. You guys are doing great. Um, maintain um, social distancing, cleanliness, all of that stuff. So I trust you all know what those principles are. Okay, course objectives, learn to understand Bayes, learn to be able to compare it to non-Bayesian analyses and what the differences might be. And so I think that's always important. I always think if I did the analysis a different way, and I came up with a different answer, what does that mean? So I'm always comparing to something. And if the answer just changes by epsilon, a small amount, ah, no big deal, that's great. You know, we're all approximate anyway. And so, but if the cha answer changes a ton, we've got a huge problem. And so that kind of brings us to one of our first points in Bayes, what's the priors, and this is a super subjective thing, if I change my, prior and I get a totally different answer, then the answer is bogus. And I would agree, probably, if you changed your prior a little bit and your answer changed dramatically, then you have a problem. You need to think about something a little bit more. You probably don't have any data. 
to answer the question and your whole analysis is being driven by your assumptions. So that's one thing to think about, just first and foremost. Most of this class is about which prior and why, and then how do you implement everything. Okay, so the objectives are to learn names to be able to do comparisons. So we will have some comparisons against name and Pearsonian testing, hypothesis testing, how Bayesian looks different compared to non-Bayesian, so on and so forth. I'll point out right now, there's no good answers to those questions. And that's why everybody argues with each other. We'll talk about that as well. Um, I should say there's no good default answers to those questions. So answers should be contextual. That's going to be one of our trickiest parts of this class that's going to take us at least six weeks to get into. We need to learn just how to develop posterior or some basic simulation skill before we tackle these huge questions in statistics. But we'll get there. Prerequisites, I want you to have had an inference class in your life. You know how to infer, you know what inference is. You're learning from data, so you're estimating things. So if you've never done that before, you're in the wrong class. You need an inference class. You need to know what these probability distributions are and how to use them. So if I ask you, given a set of data from a normal distribution to estimate the mean, you should know how to do that. And the answer is always about the same. It's always like X bar, the arithmetic average. You should know all the reasons why that's a good answer. So central limit theorem, stuff like that. If you're a bit rusty, that's OK. That's what this class is for. It will remind you. But hopefully it's not brand new. So if you say to me, I don't know what a normal distribution is, I've never heard of a binomial distribution or a uniform distribution, again, key indicator is you're in the wrong class. You need a probability class. And there's a good one being offered right now. Okay. Um, you also want to be able to do some computing in this class. I don't care what environment you use. I'll be using MATLAB for all of our examples. If you use R, good for you. That's cool. If you use Python, that works too. So now there's a lot of graphing facilities and things like Python. Um, what you want is just something with graphing facilities. So the answer to the question is usually a graph, you know, so that my grader can go, yeah, they probably did it right because they have the right graph. So a lot of um, computational assignments that I'll be giving you throughout the semester, you'll be able to tell if you have the right answer. It's what a simulation study is designed to do tell you if you're right. So we'll talk more about that as we go. But some computation. So you need to know how to use a for loop in an if statement. And I can't imagine anybody these days is no familiarity with it. And if you don't, go take a programming class. And then come and see me in a year. So but you'll get some um, coding experience. We will not critique your code. We won't even look at it. So, um, so you can turn in your, you know, three pages of code that's horribly written to us with no comments and try to ask us, what's wrong with my thing anyway? We won't be able to answer your question. Um, if you are struggling with the coding, we do have review sessions, we do have a TA. We'll go through that in a minute. This is what you guys really want to know. How's the grading going to be done in here? So I have a 30, 30, 40 breakdown on everything. Um, homeworks, I'll be giving you about bi-weekly assignments. They're not brutal. This class isn't particularly hard because we're always in Bayesian. We don't move around a whole lot. And so it all kind of builds on itself. If you've taken my inference class, we cover a lot of different branches of statistics. And all those different branches use different mathematical formulations. So learning all the math and switching all the time and being able to compare, that is hard. So this class isn't like that. So if you've taken my inference class, you're going to enjoy this. OK. Um, so homeworks, I'll be giving you a final exam at the end. I'll show you the date in a moment. Um, and then there will be a midterm. And I need to come up with a midterm date for you. We're going to need that date. My intention is in person on both of these. Now, I have no idea what's going to happen. So 
So for our shutting down two weeks before the end of the semester, and that wouldn't surprise me at all. It's almost forecasted that they might do something like that. We know for sure if there is not an uptick in COVID, something about <laughs> everybody getting together and saying, there's going to be. Don't panic. Let's just you know practice our best principles. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's an uptick and all of a sudden the university needs to do something or say something so that they feel proactive or at least reactive to the situation. So if we do have to do take homes, that's no problem. I've done those with you guys before. And so probably what I would do if, say, the final, they tell us we have to end in person two weeks before the end of the semester, I'll give you like a 48-hour exam. So I like the in-person exam because it makes you honest with yourself. It makes you study. And sitting down and doing all that studying and preparing is invaluable in my experience. You know, if there isn't that pressure, we won't do it. So if we can't do that, I'll give you longer questions that make you spend a little bit more time because you won't feel the, the pressure to do all that studying. So I'll make you do it through the course of the exam. exam. So 24, 48 hours, whatever makes sense. So we'll come up with contingencies that um, are at least going to make the class good for you. Academic honesty, I'll cover that next time. But if you think you're cheating, you are. So if you think you're doing something wrong, you are. So don't do it. If there's any questions, come and see me. But we'll talk about that. If you think your assignments have been graded incorrectly, I give you some guidance on this, but come and see me. What I usually tell people is, if you got one point different from your best friend in class, don't worry about it. <laughs> if it really bothers you a lot, come and see me, and we'll figure it out. If you think somebody's missed something that you've written, definitely just come and see me. So, don't come to me in a panic state. So it won't help you. So it'll just take more time to get through everything. Waste a lot of emotional energy. So again, if you have a problem, let's talk about it. We'll figure it out. Okay, so that's kind of the, the big deal here. So here are the logistics of the class. You know where you're at. Um, our final is scheduled for December 15th. That's a Wednesday at that time slot, that's scheduled by the university. And the final is always scheduled in the classroom your class is conducted in. And I can't change that. And I've tried to change it as a nightmare to even try. So we don't even try anymore. Um, that's not a bad spot. The Wednesday spot's pretty good. The Saturday spot sucks. You know, the first day is terrible. So that's actually a pretty good spot. Not too early, not too early. Um, if we need to pivot, we will. I just cut down where I had my last midterm just as an indicator. This is a Thursday. That's not even one of our days just because of the lag that we always see year to year by one day. And so right around there, right around Halloween is when I like to do the midterm. So what I want you guys to do is next time when we come in, maybe it's Friday, but bring your calendars, look at your constraints. If you've got a conference, if you've got something coming up, your best friend's wedding, let me know and we can try to work around it. I won't be able to please all of you to the same degree, but we'll try. So we can at least try and at least try to make sure we don't have any major conflicts. So look at your calendars and we'll figure it out. I would like to do it in class because I just like that experience of you guys Oh, I studied so much for the last few days. But the midterm's not too bad. Do your homeworks. Make sure you know how to answer your homeworks. Be able to do your homeworks quickly. The first time you get the homework assignment, it's going to take you a while. But after you know how to do it, you should be able to do it in a problem similar quickly. So it's going to echo what you see on the homeworks. OK, any questions about all that? So the midterm would be at the same class period. Yeah, it is. So this would be a 50 minute midterm. So it's like I get all my variability out of time. I don't love that. I understand the pedagogical problems. There's a pedagogical problem with everything you do. So I could do in class and take home. 
to cover all my bases, but I don't think they're going to like that too much. Like, so, but yeah. So I kind of like that kind of variability. I can ask you a bunch of questions and see where you're at. But that forces you to study, to be that quick and that calm. I like that part of the experience, not the anxiety you feel right before you start taking an AIDS exam. If you think you bombed the exam again, don't freak out. This is graduate school. So nobody really gets hundreds all the way through that. So, anyway, that's my goal. Sometimes I do it at the review session and I give you two hours, and it's a different experience. And we can maybe think about that as well. So if you guys want to discuss amongst yourselves and come up with a strategy to convince me of something, that's a good strategy. Yes, please. Do we need a calculator for the exam? No. So I'm going to look at your process. And so there will be nothing where you have to come up with something for the fourth decimal place. So if you need to express it in terms of a formula, sometimes I do have problems like that where it's like, I really want to see your formula. It's like if I give you a four-digit number, and you need to square it and you know divide by something. I want you to just write it down like that and not do the calculation. Because I I can see if you've got the right questions. Yeah, no calculator. We can use the calculator, right? And uh, no, I'm gonna say no because it won't help you. And calculators are silly these days. You've got computers. <laughs> so, you know. So I'll ask you to do a lot of calculation that you don't need to bring in your PI 87 or 92 if you're the big man on campus with the extra good technique. Give it to your kid brother or to somebody down the street. You're never going to use it. Okay, that's at least how I see it. We won't have tables in this class. We don't do that either. Yeah, so. and it blows me away that that stuff still persists. Okay, let's. Um, jump to a presentation. I'll start off with this next time. Some of you have seen something like this. Well, let's just talk about babies. I'll come back and I'll go through some of the nitty gritty policy next time. I'll just break it up. So very brief introduction to Bayesian statistics. Also, um, my name is Scotland Lehman. I'm sure you guys all know. The only one I don't like is Scott, because it's not actually my name, even though the registrar has it with two T's in it. It's not my name. So it never was my name. If you are going to call me Scott, I have one T. So I like to conserve ink on the T's. So I'm doing my part. Um, my first name is Scott, and my last name is Lehman. You can call me whatever you want. Any order, any permutation, all of that is fine. I've seen Dr. Mr. Scotland's. I know that sometimes in different countries, the transposing of the names is I still get confused. You know, what's your first name? What's your last name? It depends on who you're asking that question to. My first name is Scotland, and my friends call me Scotland, or some variant of that. You have nicknames, but I prefer you guys not come up with them. <laughs> okay. So, basis theorem. So, what we're going to talk about is a little bit of history. We're going to talk about likelihood functions, priors, and posterior distributions. So the nitty gritty of what Bayes is. And there's going to be an ample amount of Monte Carlo. This isn't a Monte Carlo class, but I'll be teaching you what Monte Carlo is throughout all, all of this. Specifically Markov chain Monte Carlo. So I would say that's kind of one of the big bazookas that Bayesians use, and that's what made us relevant. There's also other things like particle filters, different filtering techniques. Um, I don't think I'm going to cover that, but I might allude to what it is. So I don't think we'll be doing any important sampling or anything. But I'll be trying to teach you what Markov Chain Monte Carlo is. I would need to teach you a couple weeks of Markov Chain Theory to understand everything at a theoretical level, but I'll try to get you close to that without covering all the theory. So there's a few things I'm going to sweep under the rug, and I'll tell you what they are, too, in case you're interested like what I just swept under the rug. Why we need a little bit more theory. Okay, I did a, a Google trend search. This was at the beginning of my career. So I started here in 2007. This is my 15th year in a row of teaching Bayes. Um, I am a Bayesian, but I'm a lot of Bayes. 
So I used to be a philosophical alien, but I'm not anymore. I kind of like it, but I'm not willing to argue. <laughs> it's a waste of my time. But I do use Bayes, and there's a lot of good stuff about Bayes, or I use things that are like Bayes. That's me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, this is kind of at least back in 2007, I just typed in Bayesian statistics, Bayes, whatever. And what it does is it tries to look for occurrences that coincide with dates of the the word Bayes. So it looks through its corpus of documents that Google stores, and it looks for dates, key dates, and uh, um, coinciding with the word Bayesian. So, you know, there weren't any Google documents back in 1760, for instance. But it sees that there's references back to the 1760s with the word Bayes. We see an occurrence right here. And then we see kind of like it's becoming relevant and people are talking about it, but it's plateauing. And then all of a sudden there's a big spike. I think the downwardness of this histogram right here, it's a, it's a smoothing that Google does. So if you ever look at it, it always smooths that end. And I don't know how they do it. I don't know why they do it. But I don't think it was going down right here. I think it's actually peaky over here, but this is just Google Trends stuff. And I try to use Google Trends and analyses. It is a mess. I never really get anything good out of it. So some semblance of something's going on, but you don't find it all that reliable. But it gives you an idea. So this is real. Babies started becoming more and more popular. What do you think explains this hook? That's it. Yeah, computation. MCMC. That's what changed everything. People are liking some of the philosophical discussion and Bayes is being used, but it's the utility of it and people could actually implement it. It changed everybody's minds. So it didn't matter what your philosophy is worth, you can do it. It's kind of interesting. We think that is. It's not Fisher right there. Um, I think he comes in right around here and starts discussing it. This is Gossett, the t-test guy. So student, so student, he came up with a fictitious name for himself because he was working at Guinness Brewery. You guys might know the story. He didn't want his bosses to know that he was writing papers. But Gossett, the t-test guy, is Bayesian. And he starts using Bayes and referencing it. What do you think this is right here? Why does it start right around here? What was happening? 40s, World War II. So Bletchley Park, they're doing Bayes. Alan Turing, Jack Good, they're doing Bayes. Jack spent the remainder of his career here after um, he finished up working at Cambridge and Princeton and all those things. He spent 25 years here. We'll talk more about that as we go. Um, but basically, people are coming together and building up analytics is the way I think it. And Bayes was a big part of that. So they're combining all these skills. These mathematicians are getting together and they're constructing fields. They're constructing the field of computer science. They're constructing the field of statistics. So there's a lot of overlap in those things. Those fields didn't exist. There was no such thing as a statistician back then. Okay, here's my evolution of Bayesian thought. So this might answer one of the questions on the homework. <clears throat> I root Bayes at Laplace. I think Laplace understands the implication behind what Bayes knew and knew how to use it as an inferential procedure. My opinion, a lot of people might agree with me. So there's a whole bunch of non-Bayesians on the left-hand side of the tree, and there's some Bayesians over on the right-hand side of the tree. We'll try to march through some of these people, but I think you can't talk about Bayes without talking about the other side of something. So kind of the people that were um, pioneering other aspects of statistics and that we often compare to. We'll be talking about those guys throughout this class. Um, Fisher was an ardent anti-Bayesian until later in his life, he changed his mind. We'll talk about that as well. A lot of people, when they start citing people, they pick up on one period of their life and they don't put it all together. I don't know about you guys, but my opinions change all the time. 
I'm amazed at how often my team changes. You know, it might get refined, but sometimes it completely switches. It usually has to do with my ignorance of things. I didn't understand that. So then you've got kind of the early Bayesians. And this is Jack, Jack Good, who was in our department for the bulk of his career. We'll talk about him throughout this class. And you kind of have the modern Bayesians, the MCMC guys, computationalists. But the important thing is Bayes' theorem. And we're going to pick up with this next time. And I'm going to ask you when we come in, does this rule make sense to you? Do you understand it? Do you understand what it's saying? Is it something you could explain to somebody? Proving it is a different thing altogether. But do you understand the rule? And we're going to start out with this rule next time. And we're going to figure out that this rule underlines all of what Bayesians do. But it's not just this formula. There's different things that we insert into the formula. And why we do it, those are the questions we're going to be answering. Unfortunately for Bayes, he didn't get to see the rewards of all of his work and insight. He passes away before this gets published. And so, and he's just written down the probability rule. He didn't write down what Bayesians have done. So we're going to talk about in application of Bayes' theorem in terms of parameters next time. Read up through these slides if you like. They're on the, the web page. And I will correspond with you later today or tomorrow through an email. We'll have our Slack page, YouTube, those resources. But that's it for now, you guys. I'll see you on Wednesday.